people have been smoking for a, a number of decades uh, and it's been possible for epidemiologists to then see what disease risks those smokers incur. Um, empirical data, observation based. With climate change, uh, we're talking mostly about risks that will accrue increasingly and we think quite seriously in the future. Uh, but as of yet, it's uh, not easy to look around and point to specific impacts, health impacts of climate change. One's beginning to see patterns. Half a dozen different infectious diseases are beginning to change their distributions. And if you view them in aggregate, you, 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 you can say with some confidence that seems like a signal. Things are beginning to change. But the observations are, are not as crisp, specific and tangible as for something like smoking and lung cancer or smoking and heart disease. Secondly, I mean, smoking is just basically a single risk factor. You put, put a cigarette in your mouth, inhale it, incur the risk. With lung cancer, uh, with um, climate change, of course, we're talking about a very complex disturbance of a system with all sorts of dimensions operating on all sorts of spatial and temporal scales. And some of the effects are easy to understand. Heat waves kill people. More intense floods and storms kill people, maim people, cause um, infectious disease outbreaks as aftermath. <coughs> but beyond that, of course, the effects on uh, the things that are more fundamental in the long term to sustaining health and life, like food production and fresh water flows and natural constraints on infectious disease agents, those are the things that um, uh, are, are not so easy to, to, to study in simple reductionist fashion. And they're as yet not readily putting their heads up in, in, in the sense of saying, here are the impacts, they're happening. So I don't think it's saying too much to say that as a global community, we've never had to contemplate this type of um, systemic, long-term and uh, increasing threat to health and survival. I think this, this, is, this is a new dimension of public health in that sense. And uh, it is very difficult for people to um, base present understanding and actions in relation to what seem to be likely future risks and, uh, and outcomes, possibly even quite distant in time, if you listen to some of the scientists talking about 2100 and beyond. So um, now I think your question goes, goes right to the heart of something that uh, we're all wrestling with. How on earth do we um, change the way we instinctively think and behave as a human species. Because remember, we're the products of a natural selection process which is about surviving the present. And this is about surviving the future. And that's what's different. And we're not evolutionarily programmed to take actions in relation to surviving the future. That, I mean, the future just doesn't figure in Darwinian science. It's not there. It's the present that drives the process. So we're naturally uh, interested in our well-being, uh, our survival in the present tense. And uh, that's what creates the difficulty for all of us, you know, culturally, socially, uh, politically, to, um, to say, well, for the first time ever, we're going to have to use this large brain of ours, the product of evolution, for, which is capable of abstract thought and, and, uh, and foresight. We're actually going to have to use it now um, to drive policy decisions in a way that, as a global community, we've never had to do before. The, the, uh, the top dozen climate scientists uh, around Australia have been very frustrated by the last couple of years where the public has begun to turn away, turn off, lose interest um, in uh, climate change and its consequences. They've been distracted, as has happened all around the world, of course, by global financial worries and turbulence. Um, it's, a, it's a great thing that the Australian government has passed this uh, new carbon tax legislation. Uh, it was an act of compromise between the Labor Party and the Greens, otherwise it wouldn't have happened uh, in quite this way, but it has happened. Uh, certainly Australians have become rapidly aware in the last couple of decades that we've got a, a serious problem of water mismanagement in the driest continent on earth. And we've got a serious problem of um, managing our arable land as well. You know, we've damaged a lot of it. We've 
made much of it very salty. A lot of it is now unusable. Uh, we've started to look around in horror and say, God, we've done this in just 200 years as European settlers. We didn't understand um, the nature of this land and its um, limited water flows, uh, its ecology. Um, we've um, used inappropriate practices time and time again, uh, including bringing in a few rabbits as sport and now dominate and the country. Toads now, yes. <laughs> and toads. Um, so yes, I think these things have crystallised a, a new consciousness, as indeed has the risk to the Great Barrier Reef from climate change. Mm. That is so iconic in Australia, and many people do resonate to that. Mm. Um, but uh, now, of course, there's this, this, there is this need to move beyond and say, look, you know, yeah, um, agricultural production is under threat, and droughts are likely to become wider and more severe. We may lose the Barrier Reef, we may lo lose the Kakadu National Park, but beyond all of that, there are these risks that we're beginning to see now uh, to the human population itself. And the Australian government has a new body called the Climate Commission, and it has just begun the work of producing a public education document on the risks to Australia's health from climate change as part of this attempt to broaden understanding and galvanise public um, support for additional policy uh, action 